Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 162, The Price is Right. When is buying a potentially bad game worth it? I'm Sean and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Welcome, and thanks for joining us, especially those of you here live in our chat room tonight. So tonight we're covering a topic picked by our awesome Patreon patrons, asking at what point is a potentially bad game worth buying? That's the more polite way of saying the actual question that was asked. Now, along with that, I've got a review of a mashup of Quest Game and Puzzle, which is Quezzle from Unidragon. Then we stop off on the 13th floor where we jump back to the past and I share thoughts on games from 1965, 1988, and 2014. Finally, we get back to the present and I share my first thoughts on Chronicles of Avel. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First up, a comment on our Keller's Keep Quest Pack for Hero Quest unboxing video. Patron of the show, Joe Swick, commented, I love the original KK Quest Pack, and it was a blast to play through. I'm excited to run this one once my friends can complete the base game. Well, good luck with getting that game completed, uh, especially getting past the first quest. If you can just get past that first one, it's actually kind of downhill for there, at least as far as difficulty is concerned. Well, thanks for the comment, and of course, your patrons, Joe. Uh, while I own the original Keller's Keep, I actually play, pulled it out while I was doing the unboxing video. I've never actually played it. Um, actually, I should probably sell it, though. I don't know if the original Hero Quest is still worth money, but like the miniatures are still on their plastic sprues, so it might actually be worth some money. But now I am looking forward to actually checking it out for the first time for me with the new edition instead of cracking open my old one. Well, next up, another patron, Jeff Seuss, posted some great feedback on our mystery game topic from last week. In our Discord, Jeff wrote, I'm sorry I missed out on your mystery show. Some commentary. The list was excellent. Letters from Whitechapel is an old favorite for me. You already knew I love Consulting Detective, and I'm looking forward to Chronicles of Crime 1400. A few things about mystery as a literary genre that can explain why some games are mysteries that you were a little skeptical about. Mystery stories are divided between two broad categories, the whodunit and the how catch em. In the first, you, the reader, are trying to figure out who the killer is along with the detectives. Through the whole story, in a how catch em, the reader learns who the killer is very early on, and the story jumps back and forth from the bad guy to the good guys, showing both sides of the cat and mouse hunt. A lot of TV shows, Diagnosis Murder, Monk, Columbo, Criminal Minds, make judicious use of the How Catch em, or Inverted Detective Story, as Wikipedia calls it. The characters do not know who the killer is, but the audience does. Unrelated, I would have suggested researching Watson and Holmes, because I've heard enough good reviews to purchase it, but I have no opinion of my own because it's still in shrink wrap. Well, glad to hear we're not the only ones with piles of shame that aren't getting played. Uh, thanks for the great feedback and, of course, your patronage, Jeff. Um, I guess it's a good indication of how little I do know about the topic when I've never even heard the term how catch them. To me, it sounds like a Pokemon term more than a mystery <laughs> term. Knowing that does make uh, the games that are on the list make a lot more sense, at least how they're categorized on Board Game Geek. It, it now makes logical sense and it's not the problem I see is that Board Game Geek has the category listed as murder mystery, and it almost sounds like they should have two different categories, one that says catch em games and another that says whodunit games, which fits better. Because even the murder mystery, like I said, where, where does the, the pie game my kids played fit in there? There's no murder there. No one killed the pie. It was a fox stole the pie. You got to catch them. Though I do think this also explains Jeff's love of Fury of Dracula, which I know is one of his favorite games of all time. I wouldn't have considered that one a mystery until this comment. So thanks for that, Jeff. Now, as for Watson and Holmes, the most notable thing about that one is that when I did my research for the game, 
like two lists out of the 30 I looked at actually had it in their top five, top 10, top 20 mystery game lists. So it was one I didn't end up highlighting because again, those I was looking for the ones that everyone said were great. And I didn't see as many people calling that one out. I don't know if it was just age of articles or what it was, but it wasn't on enough lists for me to call it out. And it would be interesting to know if anyone out there has played it, I would love to hear how it is. And I felt really guilty because I had to break the news to him that while he still had his Watson and Holmes in shrink wrap, a new version of Watson and Holmes, Watson and Holmes 2, comes out this year. So uh, we'll see how that one uh, stacks up. Now, the last two comments we thought we would highlight this week are about our Disney Sidekicks review. First up, David Fox commented, Makes you wonder if Eric took the piss when he made this. I need to get to this. It looks awesome. And Isaac Quill writes, Oh yeah, I'm picking it up just for those miniatures. The fact that they're single color is perhaps a disappointment. No, actually it's cool because it's different. But anyway, the three sleeping beauty fairies are particularly (laughs) compelling. You basically never see them on their own individually like that. And it's a pity because they have really interesting triangular conical shape. Thanks for the informative review. To be honest, I'll get it for the miniatures alone. But the game mechanics mechanics and difficulty level actually are up my alley. Nice. Thing is, I don't have anyone else to play with, so I'm most interested in trying it as a solitaire game or maybe with myself playing as two different players. It's really the sort of mechanics you could describe, you know, the sorts of mechanics you describe, which draw me in. I could just never get myself into Pandemic, but the variety of varied capabilities and choices seems more interesting to me, especially with replayability in mind. Well, thanks for the comments, David and Isaac. Uh, starting with David's comments, I, I think the issues with this game are a lot more on Spin Master Games than Eric. Uh, the concept and basic gameplay seems pretty solid. And I highly doubt he had anything to do with the component quality, the rule clarity, or the marketing choices with this game. Next, I have to say I love Isaac's comment as it points out that what we said in the review at least fits. I really do think there is a market for this game and people who will love it. The problem is that's just not who it's being marketed to. And I'm glad to see that people may actually be invested in it just for the miniatures. As that is something, they are really cool miniatures. So it's cool to see a a Disney fan that just appreciates that aspect of the game. And it's even cooler that Isaac actually thinks the gameplay sounds good too. Some people like a challenge. Now, before I go on, I also want to thank Shadzar for all his comments on our Hero Quest content. Way too much for us to read out here on the show. You can really tell he's a big fan of the game, way more than I ever was. And you can see this passion in his comments. Yes, I made some wrong assumptions during my unboxing videos, but none of them were intentional or meant as offense to the game or its fans. My memory of a game I last played over 30 years ago just wasn't perfect. I apologize for that. So I do think some of my disappointments are still valid. As I talked about at the end of our last show, the most important thing about the new Hero Quest is that my family has had a blast playing it so far. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. This week, we let our awesome Patreon patrons pick our topic, and you too can help us decide what to talk about by joining them at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. The question they picked comes from Scott W., who asks, Here's my question for everyone in the hobby, and it's one I struggle with. What is your good sale to bad game ratio? I guess I mean, how low does a price have to be before you buy a bad game well thanks for the great question scott uh this should be an interesting one that i hope leads to some interesting discussion while almost everything we talk about here on the show is subjective and is going to vary person to person this one in particular is going to be very personal and what applies to me probably doesn't apply to sean and may not apply to anyone else out there either though i do think it's going to be fun exercise to talk about this Indeed, nothing we say here will be absolute and probably not even absolute for us. Our ideas about this may have and almost certainly have shifted by situations like the pandemic, not to mention financial situations in life. 
Yes. So that was my first thought. When I first read this question, I was like, man, has this changed over the years? Going all the way back, like way back when I got allowance from my parents and the first game I ever bought was a Games Workshop copy of Talisman Second Edition from Leisure World. At that point, every penny was precious. So I would never pick up a game that looked bad. The thing is, I didn't know what was good or bad then. There was no, well, there might have been an internet being used <laughs> by the military or something, but there was no public internet like we have now. And to find out if a game was good or not, you basically had to hear it from someone else. Or there were a few magazines out there, like Dragon Magazine, but that tended to cover RPGs. Like you might hear about it in some kind of hobby magazine. And for me, what that indicator was, is Games Workshop was brilliant. They knew they had a hit with Talisman, and they used to print other games that had a little Talisman on them that said, by the makers of Talisman. And at that point, I literally would not buy a game unless it had that on it. Because every one I bought, Warlock of Firetop Mountain, uh, Fury of Dracula, Curse of the Mummy's Tomb, were all good. So I just kept buying games with that. Now, as I got more income, I got a little bit more adventurous. And I, then what I was looking for is what I call bookcase games. And I was looking for that shape, that size. And that led me to some Mayfair games, uh, similar to one we'll be reviewing tonight later on the show, actually, though I didn't get that one at the time. Like Sanctuary from Mayfair and a Warlock, uh, Warlock of Firetop Mountain game and the Willow board game from a few different companies. I think that one was published by Tor. Jumping further ahead, there's a point where, you know, I'm working, Dan and I are together, I don't have a gaming budget, and I buy games now and then, and I will admit, most of the time, there was some research out there, I could see what was going on, I would buy stuff on site, right? Like, that that was still how I discovered games, is I would go to the local game store, or, well, at that time, even there was the sci-fi shop, I would go into the sci-fi shop, or later, Hugen and Munin, and I'd look around, but by then I was smarter and I knew a little better. So what my source was with Games Magazine. And, but I get swayed by this. So I would go into the store planning to buy, say, Catan. That was one of the ones I bought because it won the Games Magazine Top 100. And I bought Catan. But then while I'm in there, if Ian happened to have out a sales shelf, and uh, I particularly remember he had a bunch of the Fantasy Flight Silver Line games, which are all little box about this big for 10 bucks each. I, at the time, I was making pretty good money. We had an apartment. The rent wasn't ridiculous. I had the money on hand, and I bought every one he had. I bought a copy of every one of these Silver Line games. And okay, with mixed results, we'll just say there. So what about you, like, in the earlier? Well, again, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't the gamer early on. So for me, you know, it was, I didn't have a source. I didn't have uh, Games Magazine or anything like that. So it was, yeah, and and I admit, hey, I had been burned early in life with video games, yeah. um, and and anyone who is uh, old enough to remember the Atari and Commodore sixty four years, where the boxes were amazing and the games were anything but, um, you know, they weren't all as bad as ET, but there were some some definite uh, groaners out there. And you learn to really kind of be a little more cautious before spending your hard-earned money at the time, you know, especially as a kid, on something that looked like it might be fun, but you never really know until you get it open. Um, luckily, games would generally have a lot more detail on the back of the box, back in the old, yeah. you know, Milton Bradley, you know, big size family board game uh, days. You had a better idea of, of what was going on inside the game uh, especially compared to video games yeah yeah i remember those days of getting being so excited even nintendo the original nes system where i used to buy my games at the superstore because they had the best selection those games were like 60 to 80 dollars here i am spending my allowance and save up and sometimes you bring home a, a wrecking crew or, or <laughs> I, I'm, I, that's the worst one i can remember clue clue land you know they're just these terrible games so then eventually, of course, we get to the point when um, I started sharing deals, which, which oh man, is 20 years ago now, <laughs> back in uh, 2002, when I started up the WGR, and we basically started having a budget. And that is where this amount went up, and it literally would vary by how much was in the bank account. At the time, we were mainly I was mainly sharing deals on Amazon. 
and I kept it in Amazon credit because at the time it wasn't being used to buy groceries or anything. And it just sat there and I would wait for a sale on Amazon. And then we had Han Solo who lived over in Detroit, who would um, get games to me from a U.S. address, we'll just say. And I, it would be crazy. Like there'd be a buy to get one free sale, like the ones we often share at tabletop underscore deals on Twitter. And what it like, there was no limit because it'd be like, if I needed three games, I would pick the two games I want. I'm like, oh, I can get whatever, Terraforming Mars and Imperial Settlers. And then I'd be like, oh, I need a third game. And I'd try to find something in the same price range. So I'm looking for another $40 game. And in my head, I'm like, eh, it was free. Or if it was good, I got 33% off. So it's one or the other. I either got 33% off two games I really wanted, or I got a game free, depending on if it was good or not. If it was good or not, hey, I saved money. If it wasn't, I got a free game. And I bought that. That's when my pile of shame got to over 100 games. Was was in that time frame where I just I had the money I, and we had the budget. Like I, all the bills and expenses were covered by my day job, and everything I got from gaming went into gaming. And I'll admit I made some really bad choices. I bought some <laughs> really bad games, and I was just like, eh, it's a bad game. We'll put it in the extra life auction. We'll give it away as a prize at a local gaming event. And we've even had ones where like people are overplaying games. I'm like, take it home. But when you got the money, you can do that, right? And I think that is probably the biggest impact on this question is how much disposable income do you have? Like board gaming is a hobby and it should be treated as a hobby, but it's also a, a rewarding hobby that can be healthy, right? Like there's a, there's a form of self-care involved and doing things you love can be very healthy and good for you to make you forget about the horrible stuff, especially with all the garbage going on in the world right now. So it's not, I'm not saying you shouldn't spend money on it. It's a hobby. Don't spend your money. I'm saying you just have to be reasonable about it. And it's a worthwhile thing to spend your money on. But how much you can spend is obviously going to depend on how much you make and how, what your budget is. No, absolutely. It's, there's, and it, there's also how deep in the hobby you are. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, for, for me, even with more disposable income, uh, as much as I love board gaming, uh, for me, I don't get as many games with my family played for, as you for one reason. Uh, and so maybe I'm more likely to splurge on a solo game, but not as much on, you know, the bigger, you know, a Euro a or something, game. a legacy game. Uh, and because that's just where the hobby has taken me and where my family and my life has taken me, even though I might have that disposable income. Although on the other hand, if it's cheap enough, it may be something I pick up, put on a shelf and bring down to Windsor yep. to play with the bellhop next time. So there, there's certainly um, a price point at which it becomes, ah, you know what, this could be fun. Maybe I'm not going to play it for six months because I have to get down to Windsor, but it could be fun enough to be, make that worthwhile. All right, I'm going to bring up one in particular I know you bought because it was cheap enough and you're like, it might be interesting. What did you pay for Marvel Strike Team? Uh, that was... That's exactly what that was, Yeah, right? no, was that was. A, uh, and, you know, that's you know what? cheap enough. It was it was a significant deal because I know the reason I got it was because it was on discount with TG um, the gaming deals, um, so it was probably at least sixty percent off. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I was wondering because that might set your point. I think it was it was like eighteen to sixteen bucks. Yeah, and it was it was cheap enough that buying it on Amazon.com and shipping it was still a cheap deal. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I mean we're probably talking in the you know twenty five dollars all in taxes and shipping. Right. So that's an example of one for Sean. Now, I, like I said, my, my first example was definitely those Silver Line games from Fantasy Flight, 10 bucks a game. And Fantasy Flight, right? So again, I'm not, I'm making an educated guess. I'm going Fantasy Flight produces good games in general. I like a lot of Fantasy Flight games. So I'm stacking the odds when I buy this. So let's say all, all the buy two, get one free sales, all that happens, uh, whatever. There's board game deals and sometimes they go a little crazy or a little overboard. And at the time, I was meeting up with Han Solo twice a week and unloading a trunk of games. It, it was a bit much. The reason I'm out of room. And it was kind of awesome, but I, I was buying them quicker than I could play them. And it was the growth of the pile of shame. Because at one time, I just had one chair in my basement that had the unplayed games. And it was one chair full, and it kind of grew. But like eventually, it made, came two stacks. And then they started like falling off the top. And once I had to find a new solution... Other than the chair, um, which is, I didn't call them pile of shames then. I just called it the chair of opportunity or something like that. I don't remember what I called it. But once they actually became stacks I, around my room and there were multiples, I'm like, whoa, I got to slow down. 
And at that point, I completely changed my buying habits. To the point now, I actually only bought games that I knew would be good. Like I, I would do the research at this point, much further into the internet. I've, I've, I've got the Windsor Gaming resource. I'm interacting with local gamers all the time. I'm talking to people at two to three different local game stores. I've now joined Board Game Geek. I can now look at the hotness and I can do research. And I, in general, would not buy anything sight unseen or not knowing something about it. There was one exception. Whenever I was spending money, I would often spend money on games. And usually when we were spending money with some form of vacation, whether it was we traveled somewhere or I was at a con or we even if we had a staycation, we're like, you know what? We took a week off work. We're going to eat out this week. We're going to go out for breakfast. We're going to walk down Ottawa Street. We're just going to do fun things locally. When we were, When I was in that spending mood, and I think more so I could convince Deanna to let go some of the money to be in the spending mood. Uh, we would, we'd end up often buying games, especially on vacation. On vacation, I love going to a local game store wherever we've gone and finding something for us to play back in the hotel room. Because we often stay up later than other than, than your average person on vacation and stuff closes down and shuts down and we're looking for something to do before going to bed. So often we would sit there and pick up games and it's the same thing right like i we did a comic book tour where we hit every comic book and hobby shop in southwest ontario just as like a trip as something to do and i bought plenty of stuff i normally wouldn't buy because i wanted to support these places we were discovering i'm like hey new store i want to support them let's buy something small here let's buy that or we went to uh cleveland on vacation because i'm an idiot and wanted to go to cleveland i don't even know and we found this awesome store and i bought a bunch of feng shui books so this doesn't even just apply to role-playing or sorry board games it also applies to role-playing games so i will admit when i'm spending money when we're in that spending mood i will be more open to picking up stuff i normally wouldn't now again though i i've at this point i'm immersed in board game media I wasn't into podcasts, but I was reading forums. I was I said board game geek being the big one. I was watching board game geek. I was looking at the hotness. I was looking at the top list. So I tended to already know the games that were out there. And I usually had an opinion on them before we got there. But the pile of shame as far as regular purchases throughout the year almost caused me to stop. Now and then, though, there would be that hot new game or there'd be a good enough deal and I'd pick up some stuff. I, and I have to say, you know, talking about this, I, I really hadn't all that much to say about it. And then I thought, you know, there's a whole other side of this that we don't necessarily talk about. And that's my pile of shame right here of, of role playing games mm -hmm. uh, that I've got because I do this, but with role playing games. Um, and, games. and you know what? I going on to RPG or, uh, you know, uh, drive through RPG uh, can be dangerous for me because if it says super, um, I probably want it at some point. <laughs> yep. uh, now, sometimes if it's if it's at a certain point, it goes into my uh, wish list. Uh, but there is a certain point where, especially for downloadable only stuff, if the, if it doesn't have physical uh, copies, um, you know, five bucks, six bucks, seven bucks, yeah, it'll pro I'll probably grab it. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a little more picky when it comes to the physical copies, but. Drive through RPG has sales all the time. So as soon as, you know, if it's, uh, you know, under 50 bucks for a, for a hardcover book, RP, a RPG book, yeah. I'm probably going to buy that. Uh, go. if it's a super RPG and, and add it onto the pile of books I may or may not ever actually write or read or run. There you go. See, Sean thought the topic didn't apply. Yeah. What about non supers? Do you ever get tempted by like, there's an RPG drive through rpg sale and you're like oh maybe uh you know what i other than super stuff generally no uh okay. or at least super adjacent stuff every right. once in a while there'll be something where it's like oh that sounds like it could be something i could turn into villains for a game uh and maybe i'll go that way but generally no uh because i don't do any rpgs except for super stuff mm -hmm. at this point uh i haven't found anything that i can think of off the top of my head that has attracted me and, 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 you know, been cheap enough to pick up anyway. All right. So it actually got to this point, right? So I wasn't buying games pretty much almost never. And, and if I did, it had, it had to be something I already knew, right? Like, yes, I would still buy cheap games, but I wasn't buying bad games. 
which we'll talk about bad games in a minute. We'll get into that. What What is a bad game and what isn't? But now it's even less, right? So now I get review copies, right? Like I've been getting review copies of games since 2002, but I didn't do it as active as I do now. Like it was one of those every now and then someone would discover my blog or my forum and be like, hey, we'll send you a review copy and it tended to be stuff that was indie published. I uh, reviewed a lot more RPGs back then. But nowadays we have a relationship with a number of board game publishers who send us stuff on a pretty regular basis. And I am no longer like I'm getting that fix the new game fix through the review copies we get. Now, because of that, I literally went all of last year without buying a single game. There was, I didn't buy anything as long as I, as D might correct me, but I can't think of anything I bought in the last year. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm forgetting something, but then also I'm getting gifts from my friends and family that are in the form of games. And those tend to get me the ones I wasn't able to get review copies. And if there's a game I really want, I'll reach out and I'll reach out to the publisher and I'll try to get it. And sometimes they say no, uh, often they say no, to be honest. Um, and then usually I just move on, right? It used to be that I'd be like, you got to have it, but there's so many games out there. There's something else that'll catch my eye. So because of that, I haven't felt the name was walk in and buy something. Like like we we have gone to the local game store and I want to support them and I'll spend money there. But because of the pandemic, we're not even going to the store all that often. And what I've been buying from the local game store is stuff like dice, um, supplements, stuff for the kids. We bought quite a few kids games there. And yeah, Boxing Day, I did make a purchase, but it was with a gift card. But yes, I did make a purchase. And that was 2020 a, Boxing Day. That so was that's more than a year ago, well over a year ago now. Yeah, 2020, so. I bought Clans of Caledonia and two other games. That's and the last I can think of. That's the last I can think of too. So I think that's the last time. So, and and we're actually like... There's just so many games out there and so many good games. I just don't feel like wasting my time or money on bad games. And like, to be honest, we get offered review copies of games that I turn down now. And I've had people contact me and say, hey, I'm purging my collection. Do you want these? And I've been like, no, <laughs> like <laughs> give them to someone else. I don't need them. Like I did accept a large donation of games from someone locally recently um, that I got at a good price, which again, bumped the pile of shame back up. Um, but now I'm at the point that I think the only way I would spend any money at any amount on something I didn't already want would be that vacation thing. And well, with the pandemic, we're not even doing that. But like if we took a trip up to London, if everything was normal and Dan and I went up to London and I walked into City Lights bookstore and on the U shelf was, I don't even know, a Feng Shui source book for five bucks, I'd probably buy it. But without that in-person traveling, I don't even think I would like, it's just not happening now. No, absolutely. And one thing I would probably, again, we'd live in the, in, in dark times. Um, you know, if I were out, um, going to thrift stores, there's the, ch there is the chance where there, mm. where this topic, I think most fits is where you see those bad games or you know the the family style games that we know aren't good games they're not even hobby games yeah. some of them are barely games at all but that's where i'm tempted uh you know where it's that thrift mm -hmm. store you're getting it for next to nothing and you might end up spending 50 bucks but you come out with you know seven games um or more uh, and that's i think where it come becomes really tempting to me it's that stuff that you can't get new in, you, you know, you can't get in shrink wrap. You're right. only going to find it in the used bookstores or the thrift stores or, you know, someone's, you know, sell shelf, sell shelf. Um, and a lot of it for me is I want to play the bad game to say I've played the bad <laughs> game. Yeah. And so that's, what's going to do it for me. And that's where, you know, if maybe even 10 bucks, you know, depending on what it is, if it's one of those, oh my God, I can't believe they made a game about that. Yeah. Master of the Universe level stuff, you know, that that mm -hmm. horrible stuff that you just want to be able to say, oh yeah, I played yeah, that. I'm I good played that. Yeah, that's definitely a thing. Uh, thrifting is definitely a thing. But even like, even for me, when I'm thrifting though, I'm, I'm looking for games that I know are good or worth money. 
And even then, like we pass up on stuff. We know those were we, we, Deanna and I used to own a business where we sold stuff on eBay collectibles, mainly retro toys, but also some of that was games. And I know certain games are worth money and I'm not talking necessarily about Hero Quest and Hero Escape, but there were other ones. And like we pass those up. Even. So it, it's all the extra work that goes with it. So I don't have that one as much. So the one thing I do think is interesting is now when I don't have the Amazon credit just sitting there, I have way more restraint shopping online. Though every now and then a sale can suck me in. It's got to be pretty big. Like it's got to be pretty big. And plus I have to be interested in the game somehow, some way. Whereas if I walk into a store and there's a clearance section, I got to admit I'm tempted, especially locally. But that's also wanting to support local businesses. Like there's an aspect of that that has nothing to do with how much I want the game. And more to do with, can I afford to support the store? And here's a way I can do it. And I get something I might enjoy. So that is a totally different scale to me, where that price point's probably in like like $5 easy. I walk in there and there's a $5 thing that looks at all interesting. I'm probably just going to buy it. $10, I'm probably going to consider it, especially if it's something I want. Probably all the way up to 30 bucks if I'm looking at like a hardcover RPG rulebook. And to be honest, that's why I now have the Sentinel Comics RPG and the Warhammer RPG is they had a clearance sale. And do you happen to be in there to pick up something else and was like, oh, yeah, why not? Right. <laughs> At this price point, like I know Mo's been curious about these. Maybe it'll be a year and a half or two years before we play them. But at that price point, we can't pass it up. And I totally would have backed up that purchase while we were there. Yeah, but uh, there's there's definitely something about online purchasing versus in-person purchasing. There's a huge difference, and I would say, generally speaking, in person, you are more likely to to go with a, a splurge mm-hmm. purchase, and, you know, whereas online, you've got time to say, okay, well, I'll put it in my cart, but now I'm going to go open up a new tab, go over to BGG, mm-hmm. and see if, you know, Marvel Strike Force is yeah. even a decent game, you know, if, it, if, it, if it's rated four on Board Game Geek, I'm going to take that back out of my cart. Yep. Even if it is only twenty five dollars and seventy five percent off with free ship, free next day shipping, because it's you know what a, a licensed game like that, a licensed modern game that's rating that low, isn't even going to be a. I believe I can't believe I played that game. It's going to be a. Yeah. Oh my god, I can't believe I wasted money on that. <laughs> Though I could totally see buying it for the miniatures, which leads me to another point I wanted to hit tonight mm-hmm. at some point is I will buy games at low prices with no interest in ever playing the game. Especially, again, I, that $10 or less is definitely that range for me. The the I will pick up the box no matter how bad the cover looks, flip it over to the back to see what the components are. Are there going to be some like great corn-shaped pieces I can use in Zolkin? Are there going to be little sailboats I can replace my ships as seafarers of Catan? Is there a really cool D20 die with neat symbols on it? Is there scenery? Hey, man, if anything, if there's miniature scenery in it, I'll probably buy it. If it's under 10 bucks, I'll probably buy it just for the scenery because I love adding scenery to my RPGs and Gloomhaven. I use flat tiles. I don't like walls. I like flat tiles. And I have a ton of D&D dungeon tiles, but I love to put 3D scenery out on them. Same thing for the Star Wars RPG. I have a bunch of sci-fi ones, and I've got maps from Gamma World. If I see, like, I, I remember buying Mage Knight stuff. I've never played Mage Knight. Mage Knight, the, the original miniature battle game, not the new Adventures awesome solo game. I bought uh, a, a set of traps for Mage Knight. I bought a set of chests that literally randomize when you spin a dial because they were awesome little chess miniatures. I bought a siege weapon because it was a siege weapon and I have no interest in playing the game whatsoever. I own towers because Mage and I eventually put out a whole castle system and that goes to one of those vacation trips. We were in some comic store somewhere up in Kitchener and they had this giant tower, plastic tower pre-painted for like 10 bucks. And I'm like, I don't even know what I'll use it for. Like, I'm not even buying it going, oh, I could use that for D&D this weekend. I'm just like, that'll look great on the table. And to be honest, I don't think I've ever used that tower. It looks good on my shelf. So I will definitely buy a game for something else, not the game. Yeah, and this came up in our Discord as well. Um, There's a lot of people out there, especially miniature RPGers or skirmish battlers and and the foot, you know, tabletop uh, warfare type people who are always looking for more scenery, more bits, more More stuff to add to that layout on the table. And that's mm-hmm. a vitally important thing to them is to have that more scenery and more interesting stuff. 
Um, but again, that is also a pretty niche thing. Yeah. If you aren't, if you aren't a miniature RPG or, or a tabletop warfare player, um, there may not be any of that, but there may also be, uh, you know, just decorative. Maybe you like to do dioramas or mm -hmm. maybe you want just shelves. Maybe you collect, um, obscure monopoly pieces. Cause there, I, I I'm willing to bet that someone out there oh, yeah, collects sure. every single monopoly player piece oh trust me because they did blind packs and i know some people who went nuts and <laughs> vts like, like went silly trying to find all of them but well, i believe they were actually that there was actually uh some problems with that whole thing i i, I seem to remember yeah there YouTube, was there was some news and uh, stuff going on yeah about some that youtube one. stuff about that but yeah no it's uh it's a thing and collecting yeah. like that um is is again where you know if you're if you're a collector then your price, your minimum price is probably a little higher because yeah. it has that emotional connection to you. I know someone locally that would buy any game that was under $5 for the box. All they wanted was the small size box and they wanted board game boxes to decorate a wall. They wanted to, to, to make their game room look cool and didn't care if they were good games, just wanted this wall of games. And all 3D with different box sizes and shapes. And, with, and they just wanted the lids of boxes. And they're like, at under five bucks, I'll buy it. At under 10, I'll buy it if it looks neater. Like if it's got really good cover art, right. I'll go up to 10, right? So there's a reason. So there are lots of reasons, I honestly think, to buy a game, not just to play the game. Um, then there's the hoarding aspect. Some people like to brag about how big their collections are. Thankfully, I got over this one. I don't know what, but when I ran out of physical space was when it clicked in that I'm like, no, I really don't need to be a collector anymore. I don't have to own these games just to wow people who walk into my basement or wow myself, make me feel good and go, look, I, I, I have had so many people say, oh my God, he has more games than the game store. And I'm like, yes, I do. And that used to make me feel proud. <laughs> now I'm like, yeah, I do, but I, I collect games. I talk about games. It's now my life. This is what I do for a living why i have all these games but it, like i also have a lot more upstairs i'm willing to sell and i'm trying to make room are there any you really like because i might be willing to sell them to you right like that's gone but there are people out there for good or bad who just want to buy right they want more they want the bragging rights they want to have the largest collection they want to try every game i've seen new gamers a lot of new gamers come in and go i want to play every hobby board game and i'm like you know, back in 2000, you might have been able to pull that off. Not anymore. Not even close. Like, and I mean, you couldn't. And well, I mean, you know, shelfies are a thing, right? You know, if yes. you want it, you want to have the games to make the best shelfie. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a thing. I don't agree with it. I think it's ridiculous, but it's a thing that people do. And uh, I don't, you know, again, it's not for me, but more power to you if you want to partake in that uh, aspect and of the hobby. And I got to say, retail therapy could be a good or a bad thing. I, I'm just glad people are buying games instead of some other stuff, at least. Yeah. To me, that makes more sense. Fair enough. So all of this really does matter. It, it, like, it, it, I hate saying it, but like my main answer is it depends. It, it depends <laughs> how much income I have. It depends. The, the biggest ones for me. So do I have anything in the pile of shame? Like, do I, or even more so, do I have anything on the pile of obligation? Do I have games I need to play right now so I don't want to get distracted by a new thing, good or bad? Next is, do I have my pile of shame? Is there stuff in my collection that I want to go in, go go dive into and play? Why get something new when I have games I was excited about? Just get those to the table. When am I playing? Am I having a regular game night? Am I we back to hosting games? Like, I'll admit, I bought way more games when every Saturday I was introducing new people to games on the weekend. And then that price point changed because I would buy games I considered bad that I thought other people would like. That's gone now because I'm only buying games I think I'm going to like or my kids are going to like or my family's going to like. And and all of that, right? Like, is there public play going on? Is there, am I on vacation? That still impacts it. Am I, am I spending money? Do we have a lot of spare money? All of that impacts it. The one thing we haven't talked about yet, though, that I think is important is what is a bad game? Like the question said, what's your, your low price point to bad game ratio? And I got to say, I would not buy a bad game if I knew it was a bad game. Yeah, and I think there's, there's, a, there's a, back to what I was talking about earlier, there's kind of a, a scale, right? So there's a bad game that's just, this isn't a game, you know, this is, this is Candyland. This is, this is garbage. There's no, there's no fun in this. There's no point in this. But at a certain point, 
that game can shift from bad into uh you know bad movie b movie bad yep. so um, bad it's good so bad it's good um masters of the universe is, is our example no one should ever go out no. and, and do no. don't well, do no, it no what if you can get that game for under 10 bucks do it just to have it yeah under 15 probably but you know at a certain point it's like is uh, there are certain kinds of monopoly out there where it's like oh my god i can't believe they made that i need to try that um or or other sort of you know silly themed games where i can't believe they did that that would be so dumb it'll be fun to play once and mm-hmm. you know for five bucks for ten bucks maybe it's fun enough to play once maybe um, you find the looping louie you know yeah, they'd yeah. be actually fantastic even though it's silly gimmicky games. exactly or i mean you know something like go cuckoo right yeah. it's it's just this I, silly little oh my one. god is that pick up sticks no it's not it's something different um and and maybe that's what you come or or you find a game and you decide that oh this is horrible but you know what if we home rule this this and this this all of a sudden becomes kind of fun game um there's a, a a game i have that mo and i actually home ruled and it's a silly little dungeon rescue the princess game where you can like turn thing people into toadstools and with magic and we home ruled mm-hmm. the magic rules on it and it became a way better game than it ever was actually. So, so I want to interrupt with that because this is something I completely didn't think of because I am not a game designer. I have written a few RPGs. I even won a couple contests, but I am definitely not a board game designer in any way, shape or form, nor do I have any desire to be one. I want to play other people's games. That's just not my jam. But I bet you Roger's answer to this would be completely different than ours. As someone who designs and prototypes games and is always looking for components and new way things should be done, like Roger would probably buy any game out there on the entire market if it was $5 or less just to see what that game does. What's this game do? How does it do it differently? And I think that's totally valid. If you're a game designer, one of the things you should do is immerse yourself in as many different games as you can, good and bad. Get the terrible game and find out why is it terrible and think about how to make it better. And then that is a very and, valid. Thing. And then after you play it, maybe reuse the components in one of your prototypes. Yes. Uh, because again, you can't necessarily use those components in your game, but prototyping is all about failing faster. So if you can use the cards from this game to get your idea to the table and find mm-hmm. out whether it works or not, more power to you. Yeah. So honestly, like bad game, if we're, you're talking like a bad game, it's, it's rated terrible. It's, it's, we're going to be talking about one later in the show, actually. In the bellhops tabletop segment, there there's no reason to pick that up. The, the game I'm, I'm trying to be elusive. I probably should. All I'm thinking about is people will be watching this segment as standalone, so I don't necessarily want to say it. Stay tuned later, but I'm going to say it. Stay tuned later to learn about one of these terrible games. I that's why I changed the question a bit and kind of reworded it to say potentially not great games, or games you're unsure of, or games you don't know if they're going to be good or bad. Because I'm not going to, it doesn't matter. Like like I said, I've turned down free games because they didn't look like games. They didn't look fun. They didn't look, they, they, they were what I would consider a bad game. A game that really doesn't fit with me or my group. I, I turned down on a almost daily basis, a game with white text on a black background and black text on a white background. We get pitched those. And I sometimes I share them with Dee and Sean if they're at least a little interesting. There was one this week that at least did something a little different. We turn on those all the time and I get offered these like no obligation. We'll just send me your, send you your game. You don't even have to talk about it, but if you like it, it'd be awesome. We got a shout out. And I'm like, no, sorry, not a good fit for us. And I'm like, and, and there's definitely a uh, reviewer bell curve where you first get your first free game. So like, yes, yeah, send me everything. This is awesome. People like my stuff. They're giving me free stuff to eventually like, no, not every yeah, game. Please, please stop. Please stop. Please. <laughs> I get so many emails on, on bad versions of apples to apples with whatever offensive topic of the day they want involved in it yep so i actually look at it more of a games it's it, it's more what amount of money would i take a chance i think is the true question here and for me at this point it's got to be ten dollars or less like like it, like five to ten dollars like i just i don't have that spare money i have plenty of games in my pile of shame and at that price it's still got to catch my eye somehow and it's got to be in person. Like, I'm not going to buy Marvel Strike Force, even if it gets down to $4. Like, Abandon All Artist Folks was like $3.99. And I'm like, if I had seen that in person, if I walked into our local game store, if I went into uh, the CG Realm and I saw Abandon All Artist Folks for $3.99, I'd, I'd be like, hey, can we afford 3 bucks? Yeah, let's get this. It's supposed to be pretty. 
But online, I've seen that offer. I've even seen that in Canadian and I've not bought it. And then we even have Amazon.ca credit and I've not bought it. So, but it's got to be really low at this point for me. And RPGs, zero. I, I will not buy an RPG because I have so many that I haven't played, haven't touched, haven't read. I'm like Sean. I don't. I don't have it. Maybe if I could specify a genre, I could then fixate on collecting that genre. There you go. Like I get it. I've been a collector. I totally get trying to get all the supers RPGs. But with me liking all kinds of RPGs, I'm like no. Like I'm the only time I will spend money on an RPG now tends to be if one of my personal friends kickstarts something and I want to support them. The last. Oh, there you go. I did buy a game last year. Oh, maybe that was 2020 as well. I bought Worldwide Wrestling. Right. Well, yeah, with, that was on. That was in chaos. Or was that like that 2019? Was I, I, it was 2019, 2020. I don't think that was 2021. Oh, so there you it go. Delivered, so it delivered in 2021, so it, it had delivered to be 2020. in 20. All right, so there. That was one I actually, I was going to say I did buy a game. I bought that. but and, and I will say the last 2019, in 2019, I went to Origins. I bought games, and I went to Breakout Con, and I bought games off Todd Crapper. I bought his awesome um, oh, High Plane Samurai RPG. Um, I bought a copy of Tales from the Loop after playing it at Queen City Conquest under Ange. So I have bought stuff, but all of that's all pre-pandemic. Yep. And I got to say, that is something we'll do it. Uh, a con will get me to play a game. I, like That's how I discovered Card Kingdoms of Valeria. Sat down at a booth at Origins, played the game, met the Miko, and went, I got to have this. Like, how much is this? Give me this. So like, oh, you buy it now. We'll throw in the expansion pack and this awesome Miko card. And I'm like, yes, give it to me. And some purple nerds, because that was their thing then. Well, yeah, Miko can Miko could get you to buy pretty much anything. Well, now, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there, yeah, know, we're, we're, it's definitely ahead. there's definitely a lot of of different factors involved. And again, you know, it again, what is a bad game is such a huge factor in this. Um, you know, bad as a 2.0 on board game geek, there might not be much that could get us to buy it. But bad as it's a 4.0 on board game geek and everyone is like, oh, my God, you can't believe this thing. Maybe that is OK. Uh, it, it's it's all about and, you know, the theme is going to attract one person versus another. Uh, oh, yeah. Another uh, again, you know, master the master of the universe disaster may be, you know, turn off a lot of people. But, you know, if you were a master of the universe fan, maybe that's a right now mm -hmm. must grab. I didn't even think of that. Actually, there's where theme artwork and presentation will sway me. When I don't know anything else about the game, that's what's going to give me that chance to pick it up as that that last minute the uh, impulse buy. Yep, no, absolutely. Like I, like I know Renegade put out a new GI Joe card game, and I'm just like, I don't need a new card game. But if I walked in somewhere and they had the GI Joe deck builder for ten bucks, I'd be like, eh, I guess I'll give it a try. I like, I grew up on GI Joe. I like GI Joe. I like deck builders, but Full price, I'm like, nah, I got enough other games to play. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be fair. I, I beta tested that card game. Uh, and and yeah, if it was 25 bucks, I would probably pick it up. It, it didn't catch me enough to to make me want to put put it on my shelf as a full price game. Um, I, it was, yeah, it was an interesting deck builder, but it didn't. And But even with the kitsch value and the my history with G.I. Joe, you know, my my love of it as a child, it it still isn't a game where it did enough interesting things to make me want to go out and spend mm -hmm. 45 bucks on it. But 25 bucks, yeah, I'd probably buy it in a heartbeat. Yeah, see, I'm more than 20 or less, 10 to 15. 15, I think, is my price point on that one. See that for 15. But again, if I saw that as an Amazon sale, I probably wouldn't do it. Yeah. I need to I need to be able to like bring it home. Here's the other thing. Eric, I didn't even think of this. One other thing that's impacted my purchasing lately is I I try to unbox everything now. Because I'm like, well, I might as well unbox it, right? which means I can't bring it home, crack it open, and read the rules right now, which actually has changed me wanting to get something. I'm like, oh, I'll get that, but then I got to unbox it. Excuse me. Then I got to unbox it, and then we got to have three people over, and then I'm, ah, forget it. We'll just play something that's here. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. All right, well, I think that's it for our talk of how low a price has to be before we would consider picking up a not-so-great game. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic in the comments below or social media in general. Mm -hmm. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you've got a question for us, all you got to do is head to tabletopbellhop.com and click on ask the bellhop or send me an email questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now it's time to check in in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch to see if anyone else has anything to say about this discussion.
All right, lobbyists, how cheap does a bad game have to be before you would consider buying it? All right, so Jamie asked um, if I uh, noted that his collection is one in, one out now, which is impressive. I've, I've thought about doing that. It's hard because what happens with us is piles of stuff show up at once. Right now, I have a get out everything I have. Like, I'm doing the Mary Kondo thing. I hate to say it, but I'm like looking at the game going, do I want to play that right now? Am I going to want to play that? Am I going to want to play that over all this? And if my answer is no, I'm thinking, no, it's got to go. Now, if I look at it and go, oh, man, I had a great time with that. I need to get that back to the table. It stays. And then there's the ones that I'm like, oh, you know, we had some fun with that. With the right group, it's fun. That can stay for now. But if I have gotten rid of all those ones, I'm like, nah, I have better versions. I've Jones theoried. I, I, I can't see playing this again. It takes too much work to get to the table. Once I get all those out, I have a feeling I'll start also eliminating the other ones. And I want to get to the point where every game in my game room is something that if someone said, hey, you want to play that? I go, yeah, let's go. Without hesitation. Just, yeah, I'll play that. Not necessarily something I always want to play. Like, ah, let's play right now. But if anyone else suggests it, I'll play it. If I can get to that point, I'm going to worry with everything going on. I'm obviously worrying less about what public play games people enjoy. And who knows if I'll even be running games at local stores anymore. But I think I'm going to put more pressure on those stores if I do to have games on hand for the mass market popular games. Like, you know what? I, I Yeah, I'm bringing my Terraforming Mars, whatever. Terraforming Mars is a good one because most people do like it. But it's too long for most public play events. I actually cut back on bringing that out. But Catan. Like, I shouldn't have to bring my copy of Catan or Munchkin or Suro anymore. That should be something the stores just have because they have such a big appeal that I'm like, you know, you guys should have these on hand because I'm not going to bring those anymore. <laughs> you That's folk, fair. I shouldn't say, guys. Uh, Darkling Blight jumped in to say, uh, I'd say $10 or under, I'll look at the game. Under 5 used to be for certain buys to try stuff. These days, with shelves of unplayed games, I'm more picky now. Yeah, that's it. I, it's not even it's it's the unplayed games and the played games. Like I just look at how many games I have, and I'm like, do I really need any more? And yes, I get excited about the new hotness, right? If new games that do something new interest me, but they're usually not the ones that are dirt cheap on sale, right? Those aren't the ones that are really cheaply available. Like I've been wanting to try Quacks and Quedenberg forever because it's always sold out. I still haven't gotten a chance to play Wingspan, but that one I've done my research. If I saw Wingspan for 25 probably or less, I would buy it just to try it because everyone has said it's so good. But I have a feeling it's going to be too light for the people I usually game with, and I have other engine builders I'd probably rather play, so I haven't spent full price. No, fair. Uh, Will Chamberlain said, you know, aside from Kickstarter, I generally won't buy a game without research. And there's, I just, there's so much information on Kickstarter. There. There's so much information out there now that it's it's almost hard not to take the time and do the research and honestly one of the big changes is i was i was I, I was a holdout i did not have a mobile device for a long time like they were pretty much ubiquitous long before i got one of these and the only reason i got one at first is work provided it and that changed my buying habits huge and i know deanna said we got to tolka for free but i swear i bought that at hugan and munin or like ian's store hugan and munin's boxing day sale the one year and I swear I paid $10 exactly because I bought it at the same time I bought all those other games from the same company. And there was the, the the one about mixing potions and like literally all of them were terrible. And like they were all, we played them all. We experienced them. <laughs> Yay. I got to experience, but we've gotten rid of every single one. Yes. Murder story. <laughs> Interestingly, I've actually recommended it. No, that wasn't extra life. That was before that. That was, uh, that, like I said, it was Hugan and Munin. It was either where they're going out of business sale or it was their last Black Friday, whatever. It would, sorry, it would have been Boxing Day sale because back then Canada was more about Boxing Day than Black Friday. And it was all, I can't remember the name of the company. It's like there's a symbol with, a, it looks like a, uh, well, if I go on Board Game Geek, I'm sure it <laughs> says who published them. But we got, there was a Robin Hood themed one. Uh, there was a whole, we bought a whole bunch and they were all terrible. But <laughs> interestingly, Murder Story, I actually recommended to someone because their like grandfather's favorite game is Trouble and Sorry, but they wanted something with a little more depth. And I'm like, all right, normally I wouldn't recommend this, but if you want more depth and complication to Sorry, here's the game to check out. And it's a game called Tacholka, where you're trying to go along the path and you're trying to get to the, your end. 
and you roll multiple dice and you have to pick which die gets assigned to what piece. But there's things where if you land on a piece and you happen to be near the forest, you can drag them off into the forest and kill them, which is why we called it murder story. And they're literally removed from the game, not back to the start. And then if enough of your people have been murdered, you can then instead sell your soul to the demon god and the entire goal of the game switches to you want to kill everyone else instead of getting to the temple. And it's based on some Aztec rituals and oh, it's it's ridiculous. But it's sorry. And it was it was honestly terrible. But if you love sorry or trouble, here it was with more going on. Yeah. Do you have any of the stuff from the Discord? Because I do know our Discord folk did have quite a bit to say. Yeah, so uh, let me just pull that up right here. So yeah, there was, uh, uh, Major Kayla was saying, for me, it depends on people, why people say it's a bad game. It can be $5 down from 50, and I won't pick it up if I hate the theme or people with similar tastes have said no. Um, fair. A lot of people were talking about minis. Um, yeah, Brian, buying games not for the game is is a and people don't think of this like you were talking about the miniature gamers yes but also the board gamers i have bought games to replace cubes and other games because they, they they were like better things whatever they were they were neater components um one of the first i did that for was fleet some other game had fish tokens and i bought it and it was a card game and i threw out the cards and kept the fish tokens right because i thought they were cooler than the little cubes for playing fleet which is still way better a game than it deserves to be <laughs> i hear the dice game's great fair uh what else we got here um a lot of people were talking about uh you know the minis and and, and you know buying the to, to bling out uh mm -hmm. <laughs> so oh there we go yeah, math, math guy, guy david one time what yahtzee for extra dice there you go uh, there you go here's an example of one that that i, I kind of mix star wars edge of the empire I love Star Wars. I love role-playing games. I loved Warhammer 3rd Edition. Excuse me. I apologize for the gassiness tonight. Didn't even eat anything that should be causing that. So I, I love Star Wars. I love Fantasy Flights, Warhammer. It's a progression of that system. Really looking forward to playing it. And I bought the starter set and I read it and it sounded really good. And I actually went on and bought all of the starter boxes when they were on sale because each came with an extra set of dice. And I never planned on running any of the other, I just was going to start, I haven't even run Edge of the Empire yet. I ran the starter box adventure twice at two local gaming events, and that's it. I don't know, once at a local gaming event, once for my group. And my group loved it. And then we went on to play Long Arm of the Hut, which was a downloadable adventure, but like the huge, thick rule book, we never played. We never got that far. And we kept meaning to, and it just never happened. Well, I still bought all the starter sets because it gave me extra dice and that was it. And it also has maps, which I was talking about how I like having maps for when we play D&D or RPGs and they're nice sci-fi maps. And they came with little counters for the heroes and the monsters, which while I have a ton of pre-painted D&D miniatures, I don't have very many sci-fi. So having various counters for different droids and Star Wars looking things looked great. And then... Uh, Jamie in the chat's mentioning he bought an expansion for Imperial Assault at Value Village for three ninety nine. Don't own the game, but three ninety nine. That's <laughs> awesome. I would totally do that for three ninety nine. Now I own Imperial Assault. It's still my favorite uh, dungeon crawling game. But I bought every expansion pack, even though this is my my problem with Imperial Assault. Once you start a campaign, you can't insert the expansions. You have to start fresh with the expansions added right from the beginning. I still bought every wave up to Java's palace or something. I don't know. I This goes back to the, I no longer had the gaming budget and lots of Amazon money because it used to be whenever I needed to get up the free shipping, I threw in a pack of Imperial salt miniatures or I put in an X-Wing ship. X-Wing is another example. But my justification was, well, I can use them for the Star Wars RPG. Well, I have a ton of miniatures for Imperial Assault that have never been used for Imperial Assault. Many have been used to play Edge of the Empire. Same with X-Wing ships. I've used my X-Wing ships for RPGs more than I use them to play X-Wing. Yep. Uh, another one, uh, Brian was saying, you know, he got the Magic board game for five bucks at the Five and Below store because there the minis go. are worth more than that. Just the minis. Yeah, they're nice. They're pre-painted miniatures from WizKids. They look good. Yep. I bought Marvel Heroescape for, I think it was $3.99. Saw the price tag on it. No, I got this for three ninety nine at Value Village. There you go. Which I didn't even like Hero Skate that much. <laughs> Ends up this is like worth money now. Well, I don't know the way you're shaking it around. Maybe not. Uh, <laughs> just, 
it's mass market plastic. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I wish I found more Imperial Assault. I, Imperial Assault's one I wish. That's where when the big gaming budget went away, that's the one I kind of wish I had finished off because the game's dead now. Right. I would have got everything and actually went in and picked up every expansion for that one because I do really enjoy the game. Problem is, it's dedicated group games. And even when my group was meeting regularly, we were having a real hard time getting the same people every week. That's fair. So uh, we were having a hard time getting through Imperial Assault. All right, I don't see anything else in the chat now, but lots of good stuff there. Thank you all for taking part. Oh, we have one more thing. Someone someone bought a set of card sleeves on sale because they came with deck boxes. Use Pokemon deck boxes for all my magic cards for years. Yeah, you know. I could see buying a game for sleeves or or buying a game for the for the deck box. I could see that. Yeah. I don't think I've done it, but I could see it. Yep. Yeah. All right. Remember, you got a game or game night question, head to the website, click on ask the bellhop. Welcome to our review of Quezzle, Amazing Cappadocia, a wooden puzzle that offers more than your usual jigsaw. Thanks, Unidragon, for sending a copy of this puzzle to check out. So normally here at Tabletop Bellhop, we review board games and role-playing games. And this review is a bit of an exception to that in a way, because honestly, we strive to talk about all things tabletop gaming, and really, I don't see any reason we can't include puzzles. Puzzles can be just as fun and as engaging as a board game and make great cooperative and solo experiences, which nowadays puzzles are more popular than ever. So welcome to our first puzzle review. And this is certainly a step beyond your average jigsaw mm -hmm. puzzle, to be sure. Now, a quick note on spoilers. We will be as careful as possible to not spoil any of the surprises from this puzzle game during the review. Mm -hmm. Due to the difficulty some people seem to be having reaching the end of the quest, Mo will be offering up some tips at the end of the review. Feel free to skip over that part of this segment if you prefer to figure out things on your own. So Quezzle Amazing Cappadocia, which from now on I'm just going to call Quezzle. I'm not going to say the full name. I'm just going to stick to Quezzle. There's only one Quezzle out there so far, so you know which one I'm talking about. So... Quezzel caught my eye because it is billed as more than just a puzzle. It's actually marketed as a mix of game and puzzle. And tonight, we're going to highlight what sets this puzzle apart from others. They describe it as not just a beautiful illustration and a puzzle of 1,000 pieces. Mazes, additional tasks, hundreds of characters, and AR are waiting. So Quezzle was created as a joint venture between Unidragon, who are makers of high-end laser-cut wood puzzles, and IC4 Design. This is a Japanese studio that is listed in the top 200 best illustrators in the world list. It was originally funded in Kickstarter in late 2021 and is now available for sale in over 100 countries. Now, the full Quezzle experience is actually split over four different 250-piece wooden puzzles that feature striking artwork and very uniquely shaped pieces. Now, these puzzles aren't cheap, coming in with an MSRP of $250 US for the full set, though they do seem to be regularly on sale for less. Plus, we've got a 10% off coupon code, which we'll be sharing at the end of the review. Now, while I admit I got a bit of sticker shock from the price, after looking at other high-end wooden puzzles, I realized it's a lot more reasonable than I had thought. It is not a $6,000 hand-cut cherry wood puzzle, but it's also not a machine-stamped pressed cardboard $20 puzzle. Yeah, it seems like the puzzle industry definitely has a different price structure than, say, the board game industry that we're usually used to interacting with. Now, Quezzle consists of four laser-cut wooden boxes that each contain a 250-piece puzzle, a stand for holding the box lid, extra shapes that make 3D wooden guardians, and a newspaper-style quest sheet that's specific to each puzzle. When the sets are combined, you get an overall story and quest that spans all four puzzles, and in total, there are 50 tasks to complete with your copy of Quezzle. Now, the final in quest includes some clever escape room in a box style elements, rather well done AR, and six secret mini puzzles, where you're actually taking puzzles from the main puzzle and building separate puzzles. Now, along with this, you also get all the fun of discovering the many uniquely shaped pieces. 
including the puzzle are things like animals, warriors, airplanes, and even a rocket ship shaped piece. For a look at the quality of the boxes and puzzle pieces themselves, as well as a glimpse at the quest sheets, check out our Quezzle unboxing video on YouTube. So there are a few things I want to highlight here in regards to component quality. First off, the artwork is fantastic and highly detailed, which makes many of the find and seek style quests quite difficult and rather engaging. The actual wooden pieces are expertly cut, like perfectly cut and fit together fantastically. And we loved finding those unique shapes while building. So this is not made up of your standard, slightly varied tabs and blanks, like a standard puzzle. Now, unfortunately, there are some translation issues on the quest sheets. Thankfully, nothing's indecipherable, but whoever did their localization should have done a much better job. There is actually one actual error in the quest where it asks you to look for four things in one spot and three in another. This is, of course, the most disappointing aspect of any game, and sadly an all too common one these days, with games being developed in one country and language and then spread out across the world with possibly dozens or more translations required mm -hmm. from the original design. Yeah, the Unidragon is located in Russia and their art company is located in Japan. So I don't even know what the original language was here, but I got to say it wasn't English. Now, there is one aspect about the physical design of Quezzle I didn't like, and that's the boxes that the pieces come in. While the four laser cut wooden boxes look great, they're, they're well produced. They've got fantastic artwork on them. They're good for using as your reference while building the puzzle. There's no way to seal them shut. The lids sit on top. Now, being someone who's assembled a number of laser cut wooden boxes or various box inserts, I don't understand why they couldn't have built some form of slot or latch system in with these. The way these boxes are made, there is no way you can actually stand them up on their sides without the lids just opening. They have to be stacked. And for me, that's a problem in regards to storage. Otherwise, the components are great. This really is a beautiful, well-produced wooden puzzle, just not a big fan of the box that came in. Now, after thinking about this and looking around, I suspect that this may be something that doesn't bother jigsaw puzzle people generally. They seem to either ditch the box because they preserve the puzzle in a finished state, mm -hmm. or transfer their pieces to a more convenient, compact storage solution. Fair. Okay, so good components, dumb box, some language <laughs> issues. Got it. Now, what I really want to know is what I think our fans are dying to know. What are the game elements added to this puzzle? All right, so you start off as expected. You build the puzzle. Now, one neat bit they did is that puzzle one includes a, a bonus sheet a bonus sheet of puzzle pieces. And what these are is locking pieces. They replace a few pieces out of each puzzle. So they all lock together to form one big solid puzzle. Now you can build the puzzles one at a time and then do the quest specific to that puzzle or do them all at once and then do all the quests at once. We personally chose to finish them one at a time and do the quests and then save the overall quest for once everything was assembled. So what are these quests? Well, for the most part, Sorry to say they're just I Spy, Where's Waldo, Hide and Seek style games, right? Look and see. You look through the puzzle and find the ninja. Okay, look through the puzzle, find the dragon edge. Now find the chests, etc. Now each puzzle also features a maze, but these are jokes. Like the, these, these are mazes you can solve at a glance. Um, they're childhood coloring book level mazes. That was highly disappointing. I am actually a fan of mazes and I was hoping for something bigger. Now, each puzzle also features a follow of the path based on its guardian, because there's a guardian for each one, which you'll read about in the papers. For example, in the first puzzle, you find the eagle, then follow a path from it using small, pretty well hidden arrows to lead you to a sword on the puzzle. Note, at this point, you should not be removing anything from the puzzles. So you're not pulling out those dragon eggs or those stars. We thought we were supposed to be collecting these things in the quests, and doing at this at this point is actually premature. You don't have to take anything out of the puzzle until it tells you to take stuff out of the puzzle. Follow the instructions and don't anticipate. Savor it. Yes. Now, one thing that surprised me is that most of the quests were actually the same in each puzzle. Like, I fully expected, I'm going to look for this stuff in puzzle one and puzzle two will have completely different stuff. 
But every puzzle, you're going to be looking for stars, dragon eggs, chests, a butterfly, etc. You are looking for the same things repetitively. I was actually hoping for more variety. And this is actually one of the reasons you may want to wait to finish the entire puzzle before doing the quests. That and, well, they kind of tell you to. <laughs> In a way, they do say step one is to complete the puzzle, but then you can buy puzzle one separate. So you obviously wouldn't be able to do this if you only bought puzzle one. Now, along with these, each puzzle does contain a 3D puzzle some leftover pieces at the end that you use to build the guardian of that part of the city. These are well-made, and I got to say pretty cool knickknacks when you're done, like neat things to just have on your shelves. In addition, you need these for the final quest, as each one has a code word on them. About that final quest, in addition to the newspapers for each region that comes in each puzzle box, the first box also comes with an extra newspaper sheet for the full puzzle. This is the main quest, and it's actually on the back of the regional paper puzzle. This should not be started until you've done all the other individual quests and will walk you through the end of the game, which I've got to say is the best part, the redeeming part about this game. It's here that you start removing pieces for the puzzles and eventually get to what I would call a more escape room style experience where you need to use those guardian figures to move on to the next step, which I thought was very clever. Certainly something more than you get from just finishing a jigsaw puzzle. Exactly. Now, the last thing I want to call out is that this puzzle game also has an app element. At the end of puzzle one, you can scan your puzzle with the app and see a cool animation. It brings the guardian of puzzle one to life. And it's actually surprisingly well done. My kids were really impressed by this. Then when completing the final quest, there are a couple more app elements that add even more augmented reality elements, including having to like punch things in. Sadly, Guardian animations for the other three puzzles were a Kickstarter stretch goal that didn't get funded, and it doesn't look like they're coming. Well, that gives us a pretty good idea of what you get and how you use it all. What did your family think of Quizzle overall? So let's start with production quality. Overall, this is a, I, I'm almost going to swear a bit here, a damn nice puzzle. Like, this is really nice. This is, was the most enjoyable puzzle I have put together for physicality. It just fit together so well. And the shapes are extremely detailed. You're going to look at things with little tiny spikes and bits, and they all manage to slot in perfectly. And then there's finding the neat shaped stuff. Like I would say more than half the fun of building this puzzle is going, oh, look, it's a dinosaur. Oh, look, it's like a fighter. Oh, it's a mariachi. Like one of the things that improved this too is they included some simple line art on the back of the pieces. So when you flip them over, they really do look like the thing they're shaped like right it adds additional details you got like propellers on the planes and it differentiates the wings and stuff like that yeah and don't think that this is just some preschool puzzle where you put the bus in the bus shaped hole oh. it is much more complex than that yes though there is some aspects of that but you're gonna you're gonna build a lot of balloons and there are a lot of balloon shaped holes and i gotta say that really added to the difficulty there are so many shapes that were these round curves for the balloons in the puzzle that it's not so simple. Heck, we had a hard time just finding the edges because there were so many straight edges on the puzzle pieces that just because you found a straight edge didn't mean it was an, a frame. Now, the artwork here really is awesome and fun to look at. Like, there's just a lot going on. I don't know what this world is, but there's yetis walking around and aliens. And, like, I, I, it reminds me of artwork I remember from, from Mad Magazine, where there was just so much stuff going on. In it. You're going to just discover things that you're going to have missed the last time you look. And this is one of the benefits I found of the hide-and-seek puzzles, is they get you to really look at that artwork in detail. As for the quests, well, I got to say, I wasn't overly impressed. I was hoping for a bit more game to it, but my youngest daughter loved it. She was the one that managed to find all the items needed for each quest and solve the final puzzle. My biggest disappointment, though, were the mazes. Like, I love mazes. These aren't mazes. These are a joke. Personally, the individual puzzle quests are neat. Like, it, it's something you don't get in a standard puzzle, so that's pretty cool. I didn't really find them interesting or fun enough to set Quezzle apart. I wouldn't say, go buy Quezzle because it has a game just based on the, the, the search quest. That said, I will say the overall experience, especially once you get to the main quest, the ending part of this game was quite fun. Playing Seek and Find was boring, but playing Seek and Find to build a new puzzle hidden inside your existing puzzle is just cool. 
then realizing that puzzle gives you clue to another puzzle that leads you to, well, wait, I don't want to spoil anything until the end of this review, but the end quest made up for the problems I have with the earlier quests. And as you mentioned, even the parts that disappointed you, your daughter loved. Oh, yeah. My daughter really enjoyed it. My youngest daughter really enjoyed looking for the Now, this leads me to the one thing I do think that needs to be talked about a bit more is the price. Puzzle is not cheap, especially comparing it to the hobby board game and RPGs that we usually talk about. $250 US is a lot of money, and that alone is going to remove interest in Quezzle from a lot of gamers. That said, $250 for a high-end wooden puzzle, as Sean mentioned earlier, isn't unreasonable, as you found when doing some research on this. Indeed, while you can certainly get a huge number of puzzles for under $50 or even under $20, they are all more or less the same thing. Generic tabs and blanks out of some form of pressed card and stamped out with some piece of artwork that's taken from another source or license on it. Now, when you get into wooden puzzles, the price jumps, but even those are often still generic tabs and blanks. What you're getting with this puzzle is wood custom cut along with original art from a well-known art group and not something that's just repurposed from something else. True. Now, there is even, for puzzle people, another step above this, where you get hand-cut wood and limited editions. But those puzzles are in the thousands of dollars, which make this, for the quality and, and interesting designs, actually almost a deal <laughs> in comparison. Totally get it. I, and I have seen puzzle fans going nuts. For, they're going, going uh, ridiculous. For this now the biggest problem i found above and beyond the stupid box design i talked about earlier and the price point is there's no clear direction on what you should when you should be doing it and most importantly when you're done as noted the quest sheets aren't very well translated and they don't clearly tell you what you need to do to finish quezzle i've now talked to multiple people online who thought they were done with quezzle only to see me share something and realize there's more to their puzzle than they thought. It's due to this that after we finish up the review, I'm going to provide some tips for people who own Quezzel or who are thinking about buying it to make sure they're getting the full experience and don't stop early before the actual finish line. It would be nice to know you could get a whole new experience from a game you thought you were done with. Yes. Though I hope no one sold off their copy first. I do know someone who glued theirs which obviously was a problem. But before I sp start spoiling things, let let's get to an overall thought. So overall, I was impressed by Quezzle, despite some initial misgivings. I wasn't sure what to expect when it showed up, and when first starting this puzzle, base tabletop game, I wasn't very expense impressed. Yes, physically, it's fantastic. It's a great puzzle. But the quest portion was underwhelming, to say the least. It wasn't until we started to work on the final quest, when we actually had to do some deduction and look for things and put them together in interesting ways, and then got to that end, when we finally saw the words, you completed Quezzel on my phone, that I realized how great an experience the entire thing was overall. My family in particular each found something to love with Quezzel. My youngest daughter, as mentioned earlier, loved the quest. She loved finding the various hidden things in the artwork and then building the sub puzzles. She was the one that actually figured out the clue from the Guardians that led to the end game. My oldest daughter, though, was all about building the puzzles themselves. She loved the way everything fits so neatly and actually developed like a technique for tapping the pieces down. She loved the way the pieces were cut and discovering the hidden shapes in the puzzle. How many times are, Dad, look, this, we found this. Oh, we found that. Now, my wife loved building the puzzle with my oldest. It was great one-on-one -on -one time with the two of them. And I similarly loved pairing up with my youngest to solve the puzzles once they got them built. If you are already a puzzle fan, I actually can strongly recommend this, recommend Quezzle. It's a great puzzle on its own, and all the other stuff for you is just going to be icing on the cake. Not only do you get a beautiful, well-cut puzzle featuring whimsical pea shapes, you also get the puzzle element on top, which you can do if you want or pass. Now, as for the hobby board gamers out there, our usual audience, I honestly don't know if there's enough of a game here to really interest you. 
especially if you're not a fan of jigsaws in the first place. If you're not a jigsaw fan, you're probably going to want to pass on it. While the final quest was well done, I don't think it alone will win you over. And there's plenty of games out there that are more focused on the escape room puzzle style games, if that's what you're looking for. This is primarily a puzzle with some cool bonuses. Where I do think Quezzle is a perfect fit is Families Like Us, where you've got kids that like puzzles and kids that like seek and find style quests. And you got gamers who will find the overall quest at the end rather rewarding. If your family's anything like ours, you're probably going to have a great time overall with Quezzle. Well, it's, well, that's it for our review of Quezzle Amazing Cappadocia. If we've tempted you at all with this review, we welcome you to use the code BELLHOP, all one word, over at unidragon.com. That will get you 10% off your order. I also invite you to check out the written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Now, we welcome you to stick around for some tips for getting the most out of this unique puzzle. All right, so here's the thing. I have gotten a surprisingly large number of people writing me to ask questions about Quezzle based on the content that I've already produced, mostly on social media and Instagram. I guess Instagram is social media. But in addition, I've seen people sharing things, claiming they've solved this, where I can tell they haven't discovered the final quest yet. They've only done the obvious things that are in the boxes. So what I'm going to do here is walk you through the ending of Quezzle. I'll present this in an order so you can listen to it and stop when you feel comfortable and not get the whole thing spoiled. So I'm going to present something, kind of pause for a second. You can then go try to discover that. It's very likely that I'm going to mention the top thing and you're going to be like, oh, I didn't know that. Go discover it and come back later. And for those of you who would listen to the review and haven't picked up Quasel yet, I do recommend try it on your own first. And then this episode is going to be up on our blog and on YouTube and you can listen to it once you do get to the end. Pace yourself. It's the journey that's the fun part, though the ending is cool too. So first off, most importantly, if you haven't seen a screen in the app that says you completed Quezzle, then you haven't actually completed Quezzle. I've shared this screen on social media, and you can see a picture of it on the written review. No matter how much you've done and what you've, you've discovered and what you think you've completed, you haven't seen this, you're not done with Quezzle. Which might be a surprise to some people, but then it's not like puzzle people are used to needing that sort of a statement. True. It's usually pretty obvious when the last piece slots in. All right, so stepping it back now, we got we got to back up. So you 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 haven't got to that scene. You're still kind of stuck, but you realize that obviously you haven't finished your puzzle. So the key to progressing to the final quest, and I think this is pretty clear in the instructions, but it doesn't really tell you what to do, is to take those four guardians, the four extra pieces, the 3D things you built, and read the clues on them, then act on the clue. Now I'm going to give everyone a pause now so everyone can go give look at it before I give away what this leads to. They're going to take the fossil pieces, figure out the words on them, put them in the right order. Okay, so the guardians, they're going to lead you to the words, fox has double bottom, which should lead you to discover that one of the four boxes has a false bottom in it, which I thought was brilliant. And we totally missed it, even in our unboxing videos and showing things off, that one is different. Once you discover that, you are going to find a completely new quest sheet that's two-sided with step-by-step -step instructions how to continue. I found this to be the biggest hurdle people didn't get past. They couldn't figure out what to do with the guardians. They put them together and were like, hey, we have these guardians. They helped us find the princess. And maybe they went in their map and found the princess and did some more things. But this actually walks you through how to do it. And if you've listened this far, either you're smacking your head or you're cursing the fact that you didn't pause or skip. Probably true. So let's keep going. You got the new quest sheet. You've done everything on it. And now you got a bunch of mini puzzles in front of you. You've you built new stuff. It's really cool. You took stuff out of your puzzle and built new puzzles. You're still stuck. You haven't seen the screen. What are you missing? Don't worry. This has happened to many people. Next step is to find the clue words on the back of one of the mini puzzles, the specific set of clue words. All right, you found them? All right, now go look at the mini puzzle. One of them is a big evil looking warrior guy with horns and an ax. Your next step is to find him in the puzzle 
find a graphic of him, not a piece, a graphic of the baddie, and scan him with the app. The thing the game doesn't tell you at this point, and this was a hang-up for us, is that the puzzle needs to be reassembled for this to work. So once you've got your clue words, you're going to put it back together and then try to find the baddie. Now, I honestly don't know if you have to assemble the entire puzzle or just the area where the villain is. We just put everything back together. Go big or go home? All right, if you haven't figured it out now, yet just in case you're still lost and you, you you got it to scan the villain and something popped up and you got to enter a code word and you don't know what to put in what you need to do is you're going to put this code word in and i'm going to start and, and for people who know the code word big tip here i probably should have put before i paused is is keep your phone there keep it pointing there because you're going to see that villain do something and it's very cool uh the, your, your game's going to come to life a bit now, if you did miss the code words, they are on the back of the treasure chest mini puzzle, which has to be upside down. It's on the back, not the colorful part. Now, there is a hint about this on one of the other mini puzzles that says flip over. Flip over is not the code word. That's supposed to be telling you to flip over the chest. Now, we personally missed that, but we built all the mini puzzles upside down because I thought that's the way they were supposed to be because I didn't want all the swirling colors. So we managed to get the clue anyway. Now, sadly, I've had a couple people tell me they had to uninstall and reinstall the app after getting the code words wrong. So if you have entered the code and you didn't get to the end, you may need to reinstall the app to get it to work. We didn't have this problem, but someone else mentioned that. And I'm sure it's device specific. Now, I'm not going to give away the code word. After you enter the code word and you watch the villain escape, you come back in the next Quezzle, possibly, you should get the you completed Quezzle screen and get to watch your final reward. Well, I hope you enjoyed our review and solution to Quezzle Amazing Cappadocia. Now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. For this week in review, we're going to take a jump on the elevator and take a trip back to the 13th floor, where we travel through time and discover games lost in the past. Still think we need a sound effect for the 13th. So this segment, I almost made our main segment today. I almost decided we're going to review all these old games that, that I can review pretty quickly, and we're just going to do a 13th floor. But I decided to keep it in the Week in Review instead. So our first stop is in 1965 with the game Let's Bowl a Game, a 10-pin bowling card game from DRMR Company that at the time was endorsed by the Bowling Proprietors Association of America, or the BPAA. I'm going to teach you to play this one really quick. You got a 52 deck of card deck that's split into three separate decks. You got a red deck, a white deck, a blue deck. You flip over a red card. It's either going to say strike or it's going to say a bunch of numbers, a number from one to 10 on it. If it's a strike, you mark down, you got a strike and your turn's done. Now it goes to the next player. It's going to flip over a red card. Say this one doesn't have, say strike. It says seven. That means you knock down seven pins. Now you're going to flip a white card and it's going to say either spare, which means doesn't matter what the first card said, you got a spare or it's gonna have a number on it. You're gonna add those two numbers. If it's more than 10, you've got a spare. Otherwise, you're gonna add them together and that's your score. Similarly, there's one other thing that uses the third deck. You're gonna flip over a red card and it says split and it'll say something terrible like, oh no, you got a split. Now you flip over a blue card to see if you manage to make the split. That's it, that's the game. It's barely a game. Uh, this is this is LCR, this is Candyland, this is pure luck. There, There is no skill, no player agency whatsoever. I ended up going on Board Game Geek and rated this a two. Uh, it is a game. That's about it. Um, Board Game Geek happens to say a challenging game for any number of players. H how is this challenging? Like, know what the challenging part is? Is knowing how to score bowling. That, that's what's challenging about this game. The game is pure luck. Now, I did find it amusing. My dad obviously enjoyed it. There were multiple filled out score sheets included in here. And many of them said Ron and Phil, which is my, my mom's little brother, my uncle Phil, who used to play it with them. And obviously they had fun back in the day. You know what? I had 65. Maybe it was considered then. I could totally see, you know, my dad and my uncle Phil sitting at the cabin with a couple beers, just flipping cards because that's all you're doing. I, I guess this is better than playing war. As soon as I described it to my mom, now my mom's French Canadian, she's like, oh, so it's Bataille. And I'm like, yeah, pretty much. 
Um, to be honest, I it's I'm done. I, I played it. I, I experienced it. I got it off the pile of shame. What I think is cool is I was thinking we're just going to donate this, right? This this will be someone else's dollar find at the at the thrift store. But then I thought, you know what? My Uncle Phil used to play this with my dad. So I had my mom call my Uncle Phil, and he's actually looking forward to taking this off our hands just for the sake of nostalgia. So it's going to go to a good home. But for anyone out there finding copies, uh, you know, uh, our topic earlier today was, you know, how cheap to buy a bad game. I wouldn't spend any amount of money on this one. Uh, you know what? Those were simpler times. I honestly remember uh, when I was a kid going out to my grandparents' uh, cottage out on the uh, out by the lake and and playing war and yeah. having fun at at it. Uh, and whereas this is a step above, a step beyond that, not a big step, yeah. a tiny little creeping step, but it is a step beyond war. So there's you know, and again, as as Dee's pointing out in the chat room, it is a great way to learn how to score bowling. In yes. case the bowling machine breaks down because it's all automatic now anyway. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm like, it's a great game to teach you to score bowling, but who scores bowling manually? So I know my mom did. Like my, my mom and dad were avid bowlers until they got to a point where they couldn't play anymore. And my mom always brought score sheets and kept it. She didn't trust the computer to get it right. Oh, there you go. Well, at least it's getting a good home now. Yeah. No, I, I think my Uncle Phil's going to get a kick out of it. If nothing else. It'll be worth it at that point. If you are interested, I have seen copies on eBay as low as 10 bucks. I, I, I don't know. Maybe you've got that bowling fan in your family. You want to get them something kind of kitschy and amusing. Mm. Next up, we start our journey back to the present and we stop off in 1988 for a play of ElfQuest, the board game. This is a game I bought Deanna off eBay back when eBay was still pretty new and it sat on our pile of shame ever since. While it's always been a cool collectible to have, we just never actually sat down and played the game until this past weekend. So this is the elf quest story condensed in board game form. One player is going to play the trolls. The other players play tribes of elves. The elves are all trying to discover elf home, while the troll player is trying to cover it with a metal dome and prevent the elves from getting to it. It's an asymmetric game with every tribe having unique abilities and the troll player actually having a completely different role in the game who controls five different troll tribes whose individual strength is actually hidden from the elf players. You get so many points to level up your trolls, basically. There's even a deduction element of this game where the troll picks one of five sites to be the home, to be elf home. And the elf players need to discover clue locations to help narrow down their choices. This actually involves like poker chip like pieces where the trolls hidden one and puts others out. And honestly, I have never seen this until another game, the very popular Star Wars Rebellion from Fantasy Flight uses this mechanic. There's a dice based combat system. There's card play as well. And the card is where the elf quest art really features and shows up. And the cards feature iconic elf quest characters and creatures. So quite a bit of game there for the 80s, to be certain. Yeah, I would say this 100% before it's time. Back then, Mayfair, like everyone knows Mayfair games now. They're one of the, the, actually, they're no longer around anymore. But Mayfair Games was the big board game company. They got Catan. They are the company that localized and brought Catan to North America and exploded because of it. But back then, I knew Mayfair Games is the company that published Chill, the role-playing game. And I happen to have, they had a few board games like Sanctuary, which is based on Thieves World novels. And while the unfortunately very incomplete Lone Wolf and Cub game that was released with a printing error that made it impossible to play. So flashbacks to the uh, Masters of the Universe there. Yeah, in a way. Without the, well, I guess Lone Wolf and Cubs uh, has, has a cool enough theme, but it's, it's no Masters of the Universe. Now, while featuring some pretty interesting mechanics, and being impressive for a game from 1988, I got to say it didn't wow us. That said, the biggest problem seemed to be the player count. Now, the box says two to five, but it honestly doesn't work with two players. With two players, one player has to play the trolls, the other player has to play the war wolf riders, which makes sense. Those are the main factions in the game. But then when playing, there are cards with powers that say pick another elf tribe or do this, and there's a whole alliance system that actually seems really well designed where you can make an alliance between the elf tribes with full rules for betraying that alliance and the elves can work together to fight the trolls. Well, all of that's gone with only two players. 
And and honestly, this is they put two player in the box, but it shouldn't be. We also may have found a loophole in the rules. Like the rules overall are not bad. And there were some ambiguities, but I actually found a way to break the game based on the rules as written in the box. And I think we may be reading something wrong. So being the modern gamer that I am, I, of course, went on Board Game Geek to look for an FAQ or a forum post or something. And well, this game's from 1988, and I don't know how widely published it is. There is no such thing up there. I will admit a temptation to create something on Board Game Geek for it, asking questions. Um, the other thing I thought of doing is looking up who the designers are, because as uh, the designers aren't on in the high high towers that I thought they were as a kid, you know, I always assumed designers were unreachable. I have so many designers on my friend list now and on social media. I really should look out the, for the people that made the game. Maybe they're still around and maybe ask them a question or even just post something on board game. There's got to be other people out there that own this game. There are a number of people who talk about this game and there are apparently facebook groups for uh elf quest hoarders uh yes. sadly none of the three designers of that game have done any work more recent than 1991 Ooh. listed on board game geek but that doesn't mean they're not still around and i will for deanna's sake point out the fact they put sorrow's end in a swamp so there's one that will upset the elf quest fans at least to upset one of them Next, we get closer to our modern time with a stop off in 2014 to play a classic Civ building game, Imperial Settlers. This happens now and then, right? I am a board game collector. I play a lot of games. So I bought this game. I heard great things about this game. It was supposed to be one of the best games published by Portal Games. I bought it and it almost never hit the table. Honestly, I had to look it up. I have only played this game before this weekend once back in 2015. And I totally remember digging the game, being all about it and enjoying it, even playing the follow-up to it. I can't remember what it was, but there must have been something that came out around that time that overshadowed this. And I was playing that instead. And it ends up Deanna had never, ever played this one either. So here's one of those games that sat in my collection for a long time unplayed. So Imperial Settlers is a still building card game. It's one of the first games to do the multi-use card thing, where you have this card with a really good ability but you can also do something else with it that could be even more useful in trying to make that hard decision. It's got a central deck of cards everyone shares, but then also has a thing where each faction gets its own 30-card deck, which makes this game extremely asymmetric, but still has the common pool. So you do still have like the standard buildings like forest to get wood and you know joiners to sell that wood for victory points. Everyone has access to that. But meanwhile, my barbarians could make um, idols to evil gods and her Romans could make bathhouses. I thought that was really cool and very well done. Games only five turns long. Each turn you do production, then you build buildings. You have the option to raise cards from your hands or raise your opponent's buildings and do actions like generating resources and converting resources to victory points. And potentially you can do make deals, which is the, the thing where you convert your cards into deals to make more production. This does a great job of giving you a solid city building Civ game in about an hour and a half. Certainly a good playtime for that sort of thing, it sounds like. Yeah, it was a big hit. We both really enjoyed it. We, this was one of those, why don't we play this more often? How did this sit on my shelf with one play for that long? I can't believe it looking up. I'm like, oh, I played this once? How? It's so good. Now, the reason we did play it this time is that one of the things I want to work on this year is reducing my pile of shame. It's gotten to shameful levels again. And on that pile is the Aztec expansion for Imperial Settlers. But it had been so long since I played the original. And while it ends up, I only played it once. So I obviously am not going to remember how to play. We needed a refresher on the base game before diving into that expansion. Interesting. So I got to say, while the game sounds uh, and seems to review very solidly, looking into it, I think the game that it was based on uh mm -hmm. called 51st state is probably more my style theme wise yeah i can totally see that though this this game has a long history that's a bit of a mess so it started off there was 51st state the card game that didn't have a central board or all the meeples and stuff it was a card game then they updated and rethemed it to imperial settlers and then they put out 51st state master state edition which added all the meeples and bits and little ammo crates in it. And then based on changes they made on Imperial Settlers were in that, but it was considered a better version. 
And now there's even a new version of 51st State that's about to launch on GameFound this month, which people may not have even heard about yet, but I got an email because I backed something else on GameFound. So Portal Games is putting out a new edition of 51st State, and then Imperial Settlers was re-implemented as a game called Imperial Settlers Empires of the North. And now there's the Imperial Settlers rolling right. So these mechanics have definitely been tossed around, revised, re-implemented, and tried in many ways. Very, very much a shared history between the more sort of apocalyptic 51st state yeah. and the more uh, Euro stylings of Imperial Settlers. So yes. there's really something out there for both, for fans of both, uh, you know, styles and genres depending mm -hmm. on which you go and and obviously it's a solid enough concept because it just keeps coming back yeah it's true i will admit i enjoyed okay i remember enjoying imperial settlers more than 51st state and that would have been the master state edition i never played the original but who knows with this new edition and it's a deluxe edition with all the expansions so that is the one thing is, is 51st state was massively expanded upon where imperial settlers does have a few there's um um it's Three's Company, but I can't remember. It's like Three's a Crowd or something, but specifically, it's specifically three-player rules for playing three-player games. And then there's Atlanteans and there's Aztecs, whereas 51st State, I think there's a big line of expansions for that one. And the new edition is one of those, you know, big box, deluxe, all in one place, which I got to admit is just slightly tempting. All right, the elevator dings. We're back to 2022, and I've got my final game of the week, which was the family-friendly cooperative game Chronicles of Avel, which Rebel SP was cool enough to send us to review. Um, this is a really solid cooperative family weight game. I, it, it felt doubly so, I got to say, because most recently we have been playing a bunch of Disney sidekicks with my family, and that kind of flopped with my kids. Here we have a cooperative family weight game with simple to learn rules, graphic design that doesn't require any reading, and a difficulty level that seems to be just right. So actually family weight and not an expert hobby game in a fluffy wrapper. Yes. And marketed to the right group of people, I think, in this case, too. Now, I don't want to say too much here on this one because I will be doing a full featured review of this in the future. But Chronicles of Avil is a mashup of exploration adventure game and castle defense. The first half of the game is exploring the map, fighting wandering monsters, gathering equipment, leveling up your equipment, and building defenses. Then, once you hit the end of a time track, a meteor hits. It's one of the moons has shattered and landed on, on the planet, landed in Avil, and a big boss spawns and takes control of all the other monsters on the map, and they all start advancing on the castle, trying to capture the health stone. If a single monster makes it through the castle, you lose. If you defeat all the baddies, you win. Wow, one monster. That's uh, Castle Defense at least gives you a couple of, couple of chances to, to slip up. Usually. Yeah, no chances, but you can build walls, which very much give that Castle Defense feel. Every monster that moves in will take away a wall. Once no walls are left, they can come in freely. That gives that castle defense feel there. Now, highlights in this game include the artwork and graphic design, engaging um, combat, custom dice-based combat system, really cool equipment system. This is the, the, the neat, neatest part in this game that I'd love to see in other games, actually, is when you gain a piece of equipment, you put your hand in a bag, and you have about five seconds to pull something out. You're supposed to chant this little chant when you're doing this. Each item type has a different shape, so you can use your sense of touch to try to pull out the item you want. But the shapes are similar enough that even D and I sometimes pulled out stuff we didn't want. So far, Chronicles of Avel is a family-friendly co-op done right. Simple enough for kids to play, but engaging enough for gamers to enjoy, with a difficulty level that seems to be just right, with the ability to make it harder if you need to. Our first gameplay came down to the boss standing outside the castle, two of us attacking it, and if we had both failed, we would have lost. Deanna managed to take it out before my turn, and we won. We could easily ramp that up to two higher difficulties, then, to keep the game engaging for us. Well, that sounds great, and I'm sure we're all going to be looking forward to hearing more. But uh, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? 
I was really hoping to have Corey and Kat over this weekend and we we're going to do some stuff, but unfortunately they're rebuilding a ceiling. So they're not available this weekend. So I want to play some more Imperial Settlers. Um, again, now that I figured I only played the original once, we totally need to try out the Egyptians and the Samurai, which are the two factions that are in the original base box. Then I want to crack open that Aztec expansion, but now I'm having a problem that I was talking about earlier. I haven't unboxed it. Do I need to record an unboxing to the Aztec for a 2014 game? Is it worth it or do I just crack it open? I haven't decided on that one yet, but we do need to play some more Imperial Settlers. Um, I would like to get at least one more game off the pile of shame this weekend. I haven't decided what. Might be that wrestling card game. That's the one I'm leaning towards. I know D's like, oh, wrestling game. I don't know. <laughs> but you never know. A bunch of people have told me it's good. A lot of people have told me it's good. Now, I think what I am going to owe Deanna, though, would be some more plays of Arnak and or Underwater Cities. Or I've actually just listened to a podcast this weekend, one of the fellow contributors in what you've been playing Wednesday, that said Dune Imperium is actually really good to player. And the Atoma works great. So I've been putting that off, thinking that's that was what I wanted to play with Tori and Cat were coming. Crack open Dune. I I might be willing to give that a shot. But yeah, Arnak and Underwater Cities, we'll, we'll let Deanna play some games she already knows and enjoys and can kick my butt in. And then uh, possibly get at least one game off the pile of shame. Fair enough. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Lucas, thank you. Joe Swick, thanks, Joe. Evil John, thank you, Mr. Carney. Donna, thank you, Donna, aka Pax. Courtney Jackson, see you gaming like crazy on Facebook. Thank you for your support. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, the links are down below. Lots of stuff in this week's newsletter that I sent out today. We actually put out a ton of content this last week. Felt good. If you do like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, it would be awesome if you considered tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. You get access to cool bonus stuff like I get your what did you play Wednesday a day early or possibly even earlier if I get it done more early than that. Access to our Discord where you can interact with other lobbyists and bellhop fans. Um, you get bonus audio from our Sunday brunch and for our after show and lots of other cool stuff. Patreon.com slash Tabletop Bell. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show, and stop by Sundays for Brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and, and game, game on. on.